Sound is good. Slides is good. good. Slides is good. This all is right. good. It's all you. Okay, excellent. Hello. Hi. Yes, Gonessa Masson. Um, I'm a GP in Cambridge um, and I also uh, do some academic work with the primary care unit, um, which does health research based in primary care or general practice um, here in, in Cambridge. Um, so I'm going to tell you about our experience of running um, an online trial. This was um, doing research in an online format like this was new to myself and to all my uh, fellow researchers on the study. Um, so I'm going to tell you about our experience and hopefully that will be useful to you. So the, the trial that we did was um, oh, why is, oh, there we go. Um, was looking at cancer risk communication. So cancer is obviously an important and common um, condition, um, but there's less awareness amongst the public of the, of the contribution of lifestyle risk factors um, to the risk of cancer compared to other non-communicable diseases. So we wanted to see what um, giving people information uh, about this as well as giving them their individualized risk of preventable cancer would do to what they thought about cancer and um, whether it would have any impact on their behavior ultimately. So um, this slide summarizes the um, design of the trial. So we have just over a thousand participants. Um, they underwent all online a baseline questionnaire which collected information about their like current lifestyle and their thoughts about cancer, their anxiety levels, various other measures. Um, they were then randomized to one of four groups, um, which are shown here. So three of them got their 10 year cancer risk in one of these three graphical formats. Um, and the control group only saw um, some web, web based information about cancer, um, about cancer risk um, and the same information was given to all groups the control group got only that and no individualized risk information and then they completed another questionnaire afterwards and um, as many participants as possible were followed up at three months i'm going to briefly take you through um, the intervention that we delivered uh, and the results that we found and then focus in on um, our experience of, of using online platforms to carry out the research. So as I said, the initial thing that participants saw after giving consent was a baseline questionnaire which collected data on their current lifestyle which allowed us to calculate their um, individualized risk. Um, uh, yeah. And then um, the participants who were randomized to the bar graph group saw a screen like this, where on the left, they were shown their current risk of cancer in the next 10 years so of the five most common preventable cancers for their age and sex, technically, but their 10 year risk. And then that was contrasted on the right hand side here with what their risk could be if they were following um, all the government guidelines on um, lifestyle. So not drinking too much, not smoking, eating the right number of fruit and veg, etc. Um, and there were links on the right hand side to a separate website which was um, developed with um, which was also developed with Gorilla. So Gorilla was used for um, developing the questionnaires for the intervention, but also for um, developing the website, which contained all the information about cancer and lifestyle and how the um, cancer risk estimates were generated and links to further support, etc. So all of that was available throughout the intervention to all participants and they could access it afterwards as well. Um, and this is an example of one of the pages from the website, of which there were many. And then participants could um, choose to change their target values. So, um, you know, say they're a smoker, they could list themselves as a non-smoker and then a new um, risk would, would appear showing them how that had changed their risk and they could play around with this as, as much as they wanted to. Um, this slide just shows you what the second um, group randomized to to see their risk um, source instead of bar graphs they were given this pictograph or iconograph format because we wanted to see 
what different effect that might have and the the third group that got their risk got this qualitative format so they didn't get any percentages or numbers just an idea of where their risk sat on a on a qualitative scale um, so what did we find um, we uh, we managed to um, recruit our target number quite quite easily through prolific um, and we are, are, our inclusion criteria are there on the right. I'm going to talk a little bit more about about that, particularly the age range that we used and why later. Um, but just to highlight on this slide, that bottom line that shows the um, follow up at three months, um, we were quite surprised really and not being used to doing research online at how high our three month follow up rate was um, so it was about 85 percent um, which is kind of unheard of in in non online health research to get such a, a high follow-up so the, the key findings of the study um, we weren't surprised to find that the majority of participants overestimated their risk of cancer a lot of people sort of arbitrarily picking 50 percent um, at baseline um, we, we were pleased not to demonstrate that their worry about cancer or their general levels of anxiety increased um, after seeing their, their cancer risk information, um, which you, know, you could um, postulate could happen if you provide people with this kind of information, especially if they're already overestimating their risk and then you're, you're telling them that it's lower. Um, we demonstrated some short term, so immediate follow up increases in their accuracy around what they thought their risk was, their, whether they thought they, um, they could implement some behaviours to in, improve their cancer risk, um, and also their risk conviction, which is how sure they were about the estimates that they held about their cancer risk. Um, although these changes were only observed in the more numerate uh, participants, and they weren't sustained at our three-month follow-up. So in addition to all the outcome measure data that we wanted to collect when we designed the study, um, the online format also allowed us um, or provided us with. So when we got our data back from Gorilla, provided us with all of this process data as well, which um, told us a lot of detailed information about how our participants were interacting with the intervention, um, some of which is uh, detailed here. So how many pages of the website were they looking at? How long were they looking at each page? How many goals, behavioral goals were they setting themselves? Um, and how, you know, how much time were they spending interacting with the intervention which was unsurprisingly uh, quite a lot shorter in the control group um, and also interestingly we, we found that a, a high proportion of of individuals in all the groups were only viewing sort of one or none of the website pages which might prompt us to have have another look at the intervention and the website and and why that was that was going on before implementing the intervention in any other setting and that's the kind of data that we wouldn't have got had we just given people a leaflet um, because you can't measure how long everyone's looking at pages of, of a leaflet so that was quite an interesting kind of benefit of, of this online setting. Um, it's, I'll also just mention, I wasn't directly involved in the pilot study of the, of the, of this intervention, um, but it was piloted in face-to-face -face consultations as well within NHS health check appointments in five GP practices. Um, and that pilot study found high fidelity of the intervention, um, and good uh, acceptability levels, both amongst the clinicians delivering it and the patients receiving it um, within these, this NHS appointment setting, um, um, which is positive, and that um, publication is currently under review. Um, so that's kind of taken you through the intervention, hopefully, and um, a quick summary of our results. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the online platforms that we 
be used um, when designing and implementing the study and uh, our experience of them, um, some of which is my own personal experience and some of which is what my colleagues um, who were more involved in other stages of the of the design have told me so bear with me if I'm not not clued completely clued in on everything hopefully I can say something useful so um, I'm going to talk about our experience of prolific uh, first of all so I know that you all know or work for prolific so I'm not going to tell you <laughs> um, uh, what it is um, but our experience of using prolific was we liked the the interface it was intuitive um, it was easy to to s set up our study on there um, to kind of explore the demographics of members and uh, and decide um, and, and kind of specify our inclusion criteria within that um, and we were able to liaise with prolific about um, you know how likely we were to recruit the kind of study population that we wanted and I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk more about um, about the age range that we chose which actually we had to revise down because initially we wanted because our, our target population is uh, patients within NHS health checks who are aged 40 to 74 that's when they get invited for these appointments um, but but we, we were in discussion with with prolific about it and actually there weren't enough there weren't likely to be enough participants in that older age range to meet our target um our target of a thousand participants so we revised that down to 30 to 74 and then we were easily able to to recruit the number that we wanted but obviously that has issues for the generalizability of our results to to the target population that we wanted to be able to generalize to um, and that's a sort of general problem with online recruitment um, I would say um, and and it's a big concern for any kind of health research I'm sure any kind of research is that you want to be able to generalize your results to your target population and um, obviously prolific has um, not just prolific I'm sure any rec recruitment platform has younger more less ethnically diverse more well-educated numerate um, etc participants than than the population that you want to apply your results to so that that was a big concern for us in doing research online obviously uh, balanced with a lot of benefits like it was quick and easy to to recruit and as I've also mentioned the really high follow-up rates um, that that we were pleased to have um, and I've, I've written down another few um, negative points there um, like we, we had some issues with participants messaging us saying that the website had timed out and they couldn't rerun the study and where they're going to get their compensation and stuff so that generated a lot of kind of work for us in terms of getting back to all our participants on these queries um, and also um, we weren't always able to resolve those so sometimes we just had to lose those participants they they couldn't take part which was a shame um I've already... um yeah and this was to remind me to say that um the researchers who interacted with it found um the prolific interface quite user friendly and intuitive given that we'd never done anything like it before um, so moving on to talk about our experience of, of using Gorilla then. So I have to admit that I personally was not involved in the design stages and work. But my supervisor, Dr. Usher Smith, has given me some, some slides on this and um, Gorilla to be easy and intuitive um, and she, the, the code that she initially wrote for calculating um, participants risk was able to be transferred through into JavaScript within Gorilla so that participants risk could be calculated in real time as they interacted with the intervention and then they were actually stratified 
um, into higher and lower risk groups before they were randomized. So we were able to stratify within the randomization, which was a real um, plus. Um, uh, but although she did give me a few negative points, which I've listed there as well, um, about some of the inflexibility of, of, of the graphics within it um, and some other elements. So, yeah, again, apologies. I, 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 I don't I didn't personally kind of um, develop the intervention. Um, I was more involved in the recruitment and then also the data analysis side of what we got back from from Gorilla after the study. Um, so I've just included some screen snapshots of what the study looked like um, on Gorilla. So each one of the boxes here corresponds to a, a, a stage of the, um, the questionnaire or the intervention, which I'm sure you all know. So some final points. Um, about using or performing a study online. Um, one big one to stress is the, the value for money compared to you know, a, a randomized control trial within say a GP surgery or an NHS hospital, um, which are our sort of other experiences of, of such studies, which would cost a lot, uh, um, a lot more than three and a half thousand um, pounds. So that was a definite a definite plus you know quick quick results and and value for money which is you know important when a lot of this research is publicly funded um and then again my my supervisor has given me uh, dr asha smith some so sort of some of her top tips um, most of which I've already talked about so when you're choosing to do a, a health study online consider the demographics of the recruitment platform you're using so you know are, are you going to be able to generalize your, your results because if the answer is no then as quick as it may be to, to recruit um, your results are not going to help you to answer the question about about the population that you're interested in. Um, another point is that be prepared for how quickly things move once you go live. That's something unique to online research. Certainly, is that you know we're used to you, you start um, interviewing people or whatever your way of data collection is, and it takes a long time to generate that data. Whereas with an online study like this you're getting submissions within minutes and hours and you need to process those because certainly with prolific, um, the recruitment was in stages. So depending on how many successful submissions you had and as the researcher, you decide if the submission is successful or not, that determines how many more invitations are sent out to more participants. So you have to be processing those in a timely fashion um, to, to recruit and also for those people to be getting their, their compensation sensation that they should be getting um so I, I think i'm gonna have to ask you to of course wrap up. It, yeah, yeah it's my um it's my last slide so um yeah th thanks for asking me to speak and i hope it was um useful yeah very much so thank you very much